Astonishing Legends would like to thank Mint Mobile, Quip, Squarespace, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. In the late 1500s, King Philip II of Spain seemed poised to conquer any lands he wanted around the world, especially uncharted ones. Philip already controlled Spain, Portugal, Sardinia, Sicily, Naples, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Hungary, Austria, Moravia, Bohemia, Silesia, Tyrol, and Lombardy, among others. And he had his sights firmly set on the New World, waiting across the Atlantic Ocean where he'd already established St. Augustine in what is now Florida in 1565. You may remember that just last week in our show on the Cotopaxi that St. Augustine has the distinction of being the oldest continually inhabited European established settlement in the United States. King Philip II's domain was the biggest and wealthiest the world had ever seen, and soon his 130-ship Spanish Armada would become the naval force that lives in infamy to this day. The king's accomplishments cast a tall, dark shadow over Queen Elizabeth I's relatively diminutive domain which at the time could only lay claim to Ireland. In a struggle to gain some ground for her kingdom, the queen sought to expand the English empire into the new world and to that end, chartered Walter Raleigh, Esquire, to discover, search, find out, and view such remote, heathen and barbarous lands, countries, and territories not actually possessed of any Christian prince nor inhabited by Christian people. Raleigh, who would later be knighted by the Queen, convinced her that they must build a colony on what is today known as the Outer Banks of North Carolina. He had sent a reconnaissance mission already, which had brought back two strapping young Algonquin men as proof of the potential prosperity of the region. By this time, St. Augustine was already nearly 20 years old. England's colonization practice was to first establish ownership of as much land as possible and then subdivide it into pieces that could more easily be managed. The territory might extend an unmeasured distance in entirely unexplored directions. With luck, that would include access to undiscovered bodies of water, fertile lands and mountain ranges, all of which would hopefully yield bountiful agricultural and mineral treasures. This is where our story begins tonight. A small step towards England gaining a foothold in the New World would lead to years of hardship, millions of dollars in today's money lost, death, destruction, and the disappearances of countless people. Twice the English attempted to establish a colony in the Outer Banks, and twice they failed. The first time things started out well enough. Still, the situation ultimately deteriorated due to aggressive actions and a complete lack of foresight related to the indigenous people who were already well established in the area. That and the odd decision not to have any women or children in the first colony led to its total collapse with survivors returning to England empty-handed after a year of hardship. The next attempt to establish a colony is one of the most famous astonishing legends in the history of the world. On July 22, 1587, around 120 men, women, and children arrived, for a second time, to the island of Roanoke. On August 27, the governor of the new colony, John White, set sail to get more supplies from England. He would never see the colonists again, including his own daughter and just-born granddaughter, Virginia Dare. Dare was the first English child born in a New World English possession. What became of her is unknown. White would not be back for over three years due to circumstances beyond his control. When he returned in 1590, he found the colony fortified, but also wholly abandoned. The colonists had vanished. The only clue to where they may have gone was a single word carved into a tree. C-R-O-A-T-O-A-N. Croatoan. 430 years later, the world is still trying to find the lost colony. However, this is only part of this story. As it unfolds, we'll learn that these weren't the only people to disappear. Another group of over 100 Africans and South Americans had vanished prior, but the trail on them is even thinner. What happened to all of these people? And what happened to the lost colony of Roanoke? Thank you. 
Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forest Purchase. Even such is time that takes in trust our youth, our joys, are all we have, and pays us but with earth and dust. Sir Walter Raleigh, patron of the colonies at Roanoke, from his poem, Even Such is Time. Join us tonight as we examine the 430-year quest to determine what happened to the lost colony of Roanoke. And we're back. You know, it's funny you should say that. That's exactly what Governor John White said to the colonists at Roanoke. <laughs> but unfortunately, he'd been gone three years and nobody was there. <laughs> yeah, not by the time he actually got back. But I'm going to yeah. guess he said it exactly the way I just said it. Yeah. As soon as he jumped off the boat, like, and we're back. Hey, where's, where's and everyone? We're he jumped down in the water. The water splashed up around his fancy boots. And that yeah. was the, his very next line. You know, it, it just takes a long time. Transatlantic travel by ship takes two months on average, depending on if you hit the trade winds. Yeah, that's about right. I think most of the times that I looked at those trips, it seemed like they were right around 50 days or something like that to get across. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure what they did was they shot down and they went kind of south and caught the Gulf Stream and let it bring them up to the Outer Banks. But they had to be careful because Florida was occupied by the Spanish who were hostile to anybody else coming over. So they had to stay offshore enough uh, not to get spotted by any Spanish ships. The regular course is to sail southward where you could catch the trade winds. And yeah. that would jet you westwards towards Hispaniola and the Caribbean, and then you could shoot your way up north. But like you said, you had to be careful because Spain was all over Florida. It just, I wanted to refresh for those that care. The story on our main machine that we record the show on, that machine was, in fact, taken back by Apple after seven months of use, and they gave us a full refund. It was nice. They did the right thing, although I still had to go to the Apple store twice and do a fair bit of hand-wringing and waiting around and all that mess. But they are giving us a new machine, or not giving us, essentially I had to order it, and we're not going to have it for at least a month, especially with what's going on in the world right now. So we are using a very old laptop, but it's doing the best it can to keep up with everything. Its fan may fire up sometimes, and if it does, we're yeah. just going to let it do that, because if we stop, we'll just never get the show done. So uh, we're, we're getting by. <laughs> we're getting by. <laughs> we're doing fine with production. We were able to stumble through it, but uh, it reminded us once again how much we really appreciate when you visit our sponsors and what you donate on Patreon, because that's what's able to keep us going in production emergencies yes. <laughs> like this, is that we rely so much on our sponsors and your sponsorship through various means that it, it really does keep the show going because, yeah, if this thing took a dump and we did not have the funds, we'd be doing this on Scott's iPhone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. I don't, maybe that's fine. Maybe that'll work. I'm sure uh, there's a lot of podcasts that are, that's just, they're doing it so much easier. They're just live recording into their iPhones and, and streaming it immediately. And they're done for the week. Imagine how much of a breeze that would be. Yeah, that's well. Uh, we we picked the show with all the research and the planning and all that. So that that's I that's know our we fault. did the that's uh, our fault. But um, oh, by the way, as, yeah. I, before we go any further, are we are we going to say anything about the coronavirus? Or you think? Yeah, I don't think anyone's really mentioning this. Yeah. I've not heard, not anything, heard anything about it, about right? this on the news. Yeah, uh, yeah. No one seems to be talking about this. Well, we're kidding, of course. It's it's just everywhere, every minute all the time, 24-7, and right now, just for a point of record as people, you know, these shows are going to be up for a few years at least until we hit 300 shows, and then we have to... Well, that's the most you can have on the on the Apple podcast directory in terms of archive right. shows. Other ones will probably be different, but yeah. We're in that week where we're just constantly reminded about what's not going to happen because of the coronavirus precautions, but I think we all know to wash your hands, try not to touch your face... Do the elbow bump, not even the fist bump. Do the elbow bump. I like if the you foot have to. thing. That's kind of fun. The the foot. It's kind of fun. You, you kick someone else's foot. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's a little tap on the foot. You know what else is probably not going to happen is the new computer probably won't be here for a real long time because I'm pretty sure That's Apple right. builds those in Shanghai. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I have a feeling. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. It's it was from ordered the today. Wuhan Apple Store. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. God, I hope not. All right. Well, enough of that. Yeah, yes. I'm, I got to tell you though, I am really excited about tonight's show. I'm excited to talk about the Lost Colony because this is another one of our most requested topics since we started. And I know it seems like there's a lot of those. We, but really, the ones that come up over and over and over, there's probably about a dozen, and this one is on that list. And I've wanted to cover it for a while, being a native North Carolinian, or at least, you know, since I was, I lived here from the time I was nine years old through college, and now I'm back. 
And um, it's something that I've always been interested in. And I'm even more excited because in two weeks, I'm actually going to the island where this entire story takes place. I'm going to be driving right through it on my way to a spring break vacation with my family for my son. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm planning to uh, really check it out. I can't wait. I'm super excited. And it's really fun to be learning all this stuff right before I'm going. And that has the added bonus of still being fresh in my mind as opposed to two months from now when I will have forgotten it all. So I'm like, yeah, <laughs> but it's going to be cool. It's, it's re- I'm really yeah. interested because I've, I've been to the coast and my family's got a place at the beach here in North Carolina, but it's not at the Outer Banks and they've had it for 70 years. That's just where I always went growing up. So I never got a chance to go to the Outer Banks. So this is my first time going there. Oh, by the way, while I'm on this, I did want to tell everybody this is a two-part series. This is part one. Part two will be out next week. But after that, we are dark for two weeks in a row, which we only do a few times a year for my son's spring break and then a little prep time for the next series of shows. So that's just a heads up. So there will be a new show this week, a new show next week, and then we're dark for two weeks. But yeah, yeah. so anyway, I'm I'm super excited. I'm actually giddy with the excitement of having learned all this information and then immediately going down there to check it out. So that's... Isn't it fun? That's like when you read the book and then you see the movie. Yeah, exactly. I got to say, I yeah, we went back to school on this one. I remember yeah. the story, of course, when we were much younger learning about this in school, but man, not to this detail. And I think not to the amount of gory details. Not a lot, but it's, uh, life was brutal back then as it was every, <laughs> every instance in the past, it seems. And in this case, what's fascinating but also important is that, you know, America is a melting pot of a lot of different cultural influences, of course. But in the early, early days of first contact with Europeans, you had the Spanish and then you had the English and the French, of course, in the area. But this is a seminal story about English contact with Native Americans here and landing first and trying to live here, actually, not just tromp around and explore, but actually trying to set up colonies and everything that transpired after that, good and bad. Yeah, and we drew on a lot of sources for this series, but there were a couple of books that we're going to continue to refer to. But I have just got to say, I cannot sing the praises enough of one in particular, and that's a book called The Secret Token, Myth, Obsession, and the Search for the Lost Colony of Roanoke. It's written by Andrew Lawler. It is already, a bunch of you probably already know about it because it was a national bestseller. It says that right on the cover. I have a Kindle edition here, but I'm going to be looking for a print copy because I want to put this one in the library. It is so compelling. Lawler is just an outstanding writer. There's so much depth to the story, and it's amazing because you really get almost a soap opera-like feel of how all these personalities and people played out, not only on the side of the colonists in England, but also on the side of the local indigenous cultures. They're it really just reminds you that people are all the same, regardless of where they're coming from or how they live. Everybody has got people that are altruistic and people that maybe yeah. aren't and people that are good and people that are bad and uh, people that are well-suited for certain tasks and other ones that probably shouldn't <laughs> have the job. And that's across the board. And I just could not put his book down, The Secret Token. I couldn't put it down. Definitely check it out if you haven't read it already and you're interested in The Lost Colony. And frankly, it's one of those books, and we come across these every now and then, that I think that even if you don't think you're interested in it, when you start reading it, you'll love it. It's like when we have listeners who say, I didn't think I was going to care about this, and that show was really, really intriguing and compelling. That's what this book is. This is the book equivalent of that. So The Secret Token, Myth, Obsession, and the Search for the Lost Colony of Roanoke by Andrew Lawler. Check it out. And it's from uh, Doubleday, New York. Anyway, so I just wanted to say that before we dive into this. Okay, so there's no getting around it. This one is a little bit of a history lesson. We're going to come at this chronologically. It's all yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all a lot history of a history lesson. lesson. We just need to, ad- yeah. let's embrace it. Let's embrace it. Very little paranormal, but maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Are there people out there that think aliens took them? We'll get to that in part two. But in the meanwhile, uh, the best approach for this though is chronological really. And we'll try to bring as much interesting stuff as we can in as we go along here, because there are a lot of interesting players. But, you know, every single one of these people, you could spend your life studying. Queen Elizabeth, Sir Walter Raleigh, all these people, their their backgrounds are rich and well-recorded. A lot of these personalities where you get into the rabbit hole with these characters from history is that, yes, they're connected in the story, and then you'll look somebody up individually, like Richard Grenville. I don't even know what it would be like to be around this guy. One story that I'm not sure where to get to is basically for a party trick, he would drink like five glasses of wine and then chew up the glasses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for a gag yeah. and swallow the pieces and the Spanish captains would be like, I, senor, that's a bit much. 
but you'd find all these people who did amazing things and you may not have heard about them. The other thing that I wanted to say about this story in particular is that, yes, the mysterious part here is the disappearance, but why that happened and how is all the rest of this history that we're going to go over right now leading up to that point, because it all has to do with understanding the mystery and how it happened. Right. Because it wasn't, it just didn't happen uh, out of context or out of a place in time that had no relation to anything else. It was a story unfolding that led up to that moment. So to understand that moment, you really need to know the history. So to kick this thing off here, there were two initial attempts to establish the first permanent English settlements in North America. Queen Elizabeth I of England had a desire to expand English colonization efforts, and the Americas were a good candidate, as we said in the cold open here. So to begin with, she granted a charter to adventurer and member of parliament MP Sir Humphrey Gilbert in 1578 to explore and colonize any unclaimed Christian kingdoms or territories. And this broadly gave Gilbert the right under English law to claim any territory in the new world of North America, north of Spanish Florida. He had to stay north of there because he didn't want to run afoul of the Spanish. They already had enough problems with them between each other. Yes, and that was King Philip II, and he was real serious about people not messing with the stuff he already had. Real serious. <laughs> I'm sure, as anyone is, <laughs> and but he, he was had a taking lot of, a lot of he it. Wanted... Yeah, he was, yeah. you know, and you didn't want to mess with him. So there were a lot of ships out in the water that were Spanish ships that were to be feared, and they were out there acting in his best interest to prevent anyone else from acquiring new territory. Absolutely. And of course, unimaginable wealth was taken out of the Americas by Spain. And of course, England thought maybe we could get a piece of that too. And that was also part of the idea for this expansion. Well, the problem with Humphrey, though, is that he died in 1583. So Queen Elizabeth split the existing charter between Humphrey's brother, Adrian Gilbert, and Humphrey Gilbert's half-brother, Sir Walter Raleigh. You've heard of him, right? Yeah, and I just want to say, as a kid, being in North Carolina, I, and I think I said this, I moved here when I was nine, so I went through high school here, and it was a big deal. Sir Walter Raleigh, you learned all about him, and he was very <laughs> venerated and everything. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, in this past week, I've learned some things they did not tell us in, <laughs> when well, I was in high uh, school. I mean, this was in well, the, the late 80s, but um, yeah, yeah, still a very interesting character, though, very... I guess very charismatic and also a poet and uh, the queen seemed to be quite fond of him. So it's very interesting. <laughs> and, and on several levels, yes. Yeah. He's the one you remember. Not so much Adrian Gilbert, who had the other half of the charter, which gave him permission to explore Newfoundland and territories north of there. Now that wasn't just a throwaway kind of thing because there was hope of finding a Northwest Passage to the East. So if he scored with that, that could be very important. But Adrian Gilbert, not many people know so much about him or have heard the name like they have with Sir Walter Raleigh. Well, Sir Walter Raleigh's half of the charter, that granted him rights to claim land south of Newfoundland. Although, as with Florida, Spain had already explored and claimed many territories, so they have been picked over a little bit. Yeah, that's he kind of got the short end of the stick because it was already all claimed by Spain. There was only like a little stretch of that maybe he could have snuck in the door there and said, hey, the English, we're here. This is our little spot. Because anything south of that, again, you're going to be running into the Spanish and into the areas that had been established by King Philip's people. So he had, uh, I think, only a few years to get this sorted out or it went away. It was like a temporary license to conquer. <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, it was very broad. And, you know, look, it's a big country. And they didn't totally realize that because a lot of smart people back then, Richard Hacklett being one of them, they thought that the Pacific Ocean was not that far away, maybe from these unexplored territories. They weren't sure how far away or how wide North America was. And that was the key goal here, not only riches, but finding this Northwest Passage to get to the Pacific. So Walter Raleigh's patent was issued on March 25th, 1584, and this opened the door for British expansion into North America's eastern coast. But as you were alluding to, there was a stipulation in the terms that mandated he had to establish a colony by 1591 or he would lose his right to colonization. In addition to founding colonies, 
Raleigh was also expected to set up operations so that English privateers could use them to rob Spanish treasure ships. Yeah, and this was a big deal here. This is where a lot of espionage was coming into play between Spain and England because King Philip would sometimes get word that something was happening, something was afoot. And not only that, it was going to be a possible base to attack all the wealth that he was sending. Because here's the other thing especially if you can get north of where he is in Florida, thanks to the Gulf Stream, which moves from the south to the north and takes the ships back across the Atlantic to Spain and France and England, you're going to go right by there with all that stuff. So if somebody can get a base in place north of all the territory that he has down in what today is Florida and even a little north of there, then you can just snatch the gold and whatever he's pilfering from poor South America as they go by you. So that was a big concern for him. And that was why there was uh, espionage concerns in terms of where would these colonies go? Where might they be? And it also plays a factor in a lack of information about the specificity of what was going on specifically with Roanoke. Mm -hmm. There's some indication and some suggestion from Lawler in his book that I mentioned at the top of the show, and he's speculating, but he was speculating that in cases where they were very nonspecific about different parts of the process and different locations when reporting back, it was thought that maybe they were keeping that off paper to protect the interests of having the colony and also to keep it hidden from King Philip and his spies. A lot of contention here, as you could say, historically, and especially during these times when so much wealth and power and control of the seas and shipping and, well, money was going on, that it was a major play here. And of course, Spain was the bigger player. So that's one of the reasons, of course, that England now wants their share of the big pie, which is the new world. Have you looked at your wireless bill lately? You're probably paying too much. Look, it's 2020. Network coverage is better than ever, no matter your wireless provider. So why pay more for the same service? That's where Mint Mobile comes in. They can cut your bill down to 15 bucks a month for the same premium coverage. I know what you're thinking. This is too good to be true, but these guys know what they're doing. Scott and I made the switch about, uh, was it a year and a half ago? Yeah, like two years now, Like two years, maybe. Maybe two for me, anyway. Yeah, and we've both remarked to each other about what it's like to get a wireless bill in the mail today versus back then, right? Yeah, it's night and day. I'm honestly kind of embarrassed just to think about what my monthly wireless bills were before I switched to Mint Mobile. Oh, same here. You know, the difference in the monthly expenditure, the savings, I should say, are real and quantitative with Mint Mobile. Forrest, this is one of those offers that I really do hope our listeners take advantage of because Mint Mobile makes it so easy to cut your wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month. And how can they do that, the people might be asking themselves about now. And rightly so. Well, your old wireless bills were paying for expensive retail stores and all the retail overhead that goes along with a traditional brick-and-mortar mobile provider. And that's the reason why Mint Mobile reimagined how we buy wireless. Then they made it all online passing the savings directly to the consumer. And that's you and me, and it's about time, too. Uh, Doesn't it seem like those storefronts are everywhere these days? It does to me. And in fact, my son actually commented on it the other day when we were in the car. He was like, what? These stores are everywhere. (laughs) Frankly, I don't see the demand. Well, you know, whether you see the demand or not, it's there and they want us to pay for that physical space. Well, there's three important points that we'd like to make about Mint Mobile service. First, every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text, plus crazy fast 4G LTE. Yeah, and Scott and I deal with a lot of streaming media producing a show, and as you can imagine, our phones are put to the test every day, and I am totally impressed with Mint's capabilities. I couldn't agree more, and the second point I'd like to make is you can use your own phone, yes you can, with any Mint mobile plan and keep your same phone number. Along with all your existing contacts. Absolutely. And lastly, if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven-day money-back guarantee. Try it out. Don't like it? That's fine. There's a seven-day guarantee. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash A-L. That's mintmobile.com slash A-L. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash A-L. Hi, I'm Nicole Morocco. And when I'm not writing stories about the paranormal, I'm listening obsessively to Astonishing Legends. Now, let's get back to the show.
Well, Sir Walter Raleigh, and again, I don't have to tell you this because you learned it all in school, was a British aristocrat and part of the landed gentry. And that social status title of landed gentry will come up again as people want to come to the new world here. Well, the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, is also named after him. I think you mentioned that several times. Oh, yes, I've mentioned it many, many times. <laughs> it's, and it's the all capital. Right. And also, he is uh, well known for bringing tobacco to England from this region, which uh, went on to earn many billions of dollars and continues to earn many billions of dollars off of tobacco, believe it or not. So Raleigh himself, though, and again, what's, this is the other funny thing about you read of all the major characters in this historical setting and story and time and place, and they all read the same, like Raleigh. He was an explorer, a soldier, a spy. A politician, a writer, a poet. I guess that's what everybody did nowadays. I could maybe do half of one of those things and not very well. And I just want to say, by the way, his poetry is good. There's some good stuff there. Well, maybe it was his poetry or his dashing good looks, but he was a favorite of Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. In the beginning, that is until he fell out of favor by marrying one of the Queen's ladies-in-waiting, Elizabeth Throckmorton. Yes, without permission. That's the thing. He was supposed to ask yeah. for permission from the queen to do that. That was a mistake. I doubt she would have been cool with that. <laughs> yeah. But in any case, not asking permission of the queen was not the right thing to do. And the couple were thrown into the Tower of London in 1591. Uh, yeah, not the honeymoon they were hoping for, I imagine. No, the, the heart-shaped tub was not working. <laughs> <laughs> well, the queen fancied Raleigh. And it seems maybe from this harsh reaction, you get some idea why or, or proof of that. Raleigh was also forbidden to leave her court, which is why he never personally went on these overseas explorations himself, but he instead sent his trusted associates to the New World while he oversaw progress from London. Yeah, and one of the things that Lawler said in his book, and I, I'm not sure where it was in the timeline exactly, but I'm pretty sure at one point she had appointed him her bodyguard. It was a, a significant consideration for her because at the time she was dealing with assassination attempts, several, with That's people right. coming at her with knives and all that kind of stuff. So, And I don't know if he ever personally thwarted any of that. And obviously there could be other reasons that she went, might have said, hey, you have to stick around all the time. But on the other hand, that was his job, uh, at least for a bit, was to protect her. So he may have been a more effective administrator from her court, but th there is one thing about Raleigh that uh, you should mention here, Scott, is that he's not totally the romantic figure completely that we all think about. No, this was a real surprise to me. And like I said, not something they taught me uh, at Needham Broughton High School in Raleigh when I was there in the late 80s, <laughs> mm -hmm, when we were, mm -hmm. you know, they were essentially cramming Sir Walter Raleigh down our throats. We're just like, Raleigh, 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 because I was in <laughs> Raleigh, of course. Yeah, and right. it turns out that there was an uprising in Ireland that had been backed by King Philip, who was obviously the primary antagonist for Queen Elizabeth right. at this time. And the Pope prompted Queen Elizabeth to send Raleigh to assist in battling the threat. And uh, that's a direct quote. I'm going to read this now from Lawler's book, The Secret Token, that we mentioned at the top of the show. This is on page 29 of the book in the Kindle edition. An uprising in Ireland backed by Philip and the Pope prompted her to send Raleigh to assist in battling the threat. His superiors ordered him to oversee the massacre of more than 500 prisoners including women and children, which he accomplished with murderous efficiency. Mm. That's one of those things, and Lawler doesn't have a lot of asides like that about Raleigh in his book here, but he's obviously done the research. But that's one of those things where you're like, oh, okay, this is a dimension to this person that I didn't know existed. Yeah. That's quite something there. Uh, all the rest of the stories or about the colonization and what led to all kinds of positive things in the long run, even though the lost colony was a misfire. What, oh, by the way, he went to Ireland and killed 500 prisoners, including women and children. Yeah, and... I mean, uh, it was a different time, right? <laughs> Just, <laughs> so, well, that's the other thing you learn looking into these people and their actions from representatives of governments and as individuals with their own predilections is that there's a lot of brutality with everyone. Most of these characters had some brush with tremendous brutality and bloodshed at some point in their histories. Yeah. Let's talk about the first expedition Raleigh sends over to explore the New World. This expedition, the first one he organized, consisted of two barks, and that's B-A-R-Q-U-E-S, or, or like bark, like a bark of a tree or a dog. And these are sailing ships with three or more masts. 
And these two barks, these two ships, left England on April 17th, 1584. This initial mission is known as the Amadas Barlow Expedition, named for the captains of the two ships, Philip Amadas and Arthur Barlow. And the two ships took the regular route to cross the Atlantic, as we were talking about before, which is to sail south to catch the trade winds, stop on the West Indies for fresh supplies, and then sail north. The expedition sighted land on July 4th at what is present-day Cape Fear. And uh, weren't you the inspiration for the Robert De Niro character in the movie? <laughs> no, oh, I'm sorry, that's somebody else. No, that Wait, was, was uh, his line. He had a line. Well, he had several. Yeah, and his southern accent, by the way, not much better than yours. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> come out, come out wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what he was right. doing. I can't do his deep voice, but yeah. like... The R is yeah. a R. R. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That is the same place, though, isn't it? That is Cape Fear. Yeah, that was Cape right? Fear. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. on, on the river. Uh, yeah, down in that... I think it was in that part of the country. Yeah. But right, anyway. Woo. Right, Do you know why it's called Cape Fear? Um, I purposely did not look this up because I was going to put you on the spot about it, and, and that's what I'm doing now. Hang on. Let me see. Okay, Sarah, pretend that I just knew this right away. All right. <clears throat> I'm taking this from... Uh, <laughs> I'm taking this from the Wikipedia page. <laughs> the name for Cape Fear, which is the Cape Fear, which is where the river comes out, by the way, that's an uh -huh. actual cape, a prominent headland jutting into the Atlantic Ocean from Bald Head Island on the coast of North Carolina. And uh, again, that's quoting Wikipedia. The name comes from the 1585 expedition of Sir Richard Grenville. Sailing to Roanoke Island, we're going to be talking about this very expedition here in a little bit. His ship became embayed behind the Cape. Some of the crew were afraid they would wreck, giving rise to the name Cape Fear. It is the fifth oldest surviving English place name in the United States. Well, this story here, this topic has got it all. It is so seminal here. Well, the fleet actually made landfall on July 13th, just north of Hatteras Island. Now, have you been there? Because I'm going to ask you, of course, have you been to every place we're going to mention? <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. I think I said, and if you were paying attention to me, which obviously you mm -hmm. never are, at the beginning uh, of sure. the show, I've never been to this part of the coast. I've always been down to where my family's place in Wilmington, which is considerably further right. south, so or outside of Wilmington. I do Carolina know, Beach, yeah, Cary Beach, uh, right. down there, Southport area, I've been down there. But I've never been to Hatteras, but in two weeks, uh, unless... The coronavirus shuts down driving, <laughs> <laughs> which is... Uh, uh, they all don't drive with their windows open. Yeah, yeah. I, but I, I will be going there, so I'm very excited. But no, I have not been there yet. But I can't wait to see it because I think uh, geographically it's going to be a part of the state that I've never seen. It'll be new to me the way it, it feels, you know, everything about it. I'm Yeah, I'm sure, sure. Yeah. Seriously, the reason I ask is that uh, oftentimes with Scott, like, he'll say, like, oh, I've never been to this part of the country. And then he said, but I have been to this spot and he'll have something interesting to tell us about it. Yeah. So I'll often ask because he, he's usually got a surprise about someplace you think he hasn't been. Yeah. And here's the thing. I guess I was 45 when we started Astonishing Legends. Mm hmm After an illustrious <laughs> but long forgotten career editing TV commercials for almost 20 years. So, cool. um, it, yeah, that's where I was earlier uh, because uh, Amadis, Philip Amadis, he was um, 19. Did you know that? He was only 19 wow. and uh, Barlow was 34. So uh, it's mm. pretty crazy when you think about it. What were you? I can't remember what I was doing when I was 19. I barely remember what I was doing when I was 34. So, <laughs> yeah, a lot more responsibility <laughs> thrust upon them at an earlier age. Well, uh, when Amartus and Barlow actually returned to England, they reported that Roanoke Island offered a strategic location and that the Native Americans they had encountered there, the Sakodan, I believe, uh, by the way, we're just going to say them as their, the Native American words okay. from this region and, yeah. and time period, real hard to find any confirmation on. And also, I've been gone from North Carolina so long... I don't even know the local pronunciations of a lot of them anymore, so I'm just going to go for it. Folks, you're going to hear each one of these names, these Native American names, mentioned in several different ways. So if you find one you like, just stick with that and have that you know, ring in your ears for the rest of it, because uh, we have a hard time keeping this all together. And I just want to say here, we spent a lot of time, or at least I did, trying to find an authentic pronunciation by a Native American. I finally found one, and we'll get to it here. I'll call it out when we see it, is that finally one of these Algonquian Carolina name places here is being pronounced by a Native American because the YouTuber was, uh, his handle goes by Ask an Injun. So yeah, <laughs> I, and it's a middle-aged <laughs> guy, cool. and I, I believe, of course, he is a Native American, but I don't believe he's from the region. And he says, 
I'm just going to tell you right now, I have a public school education and I, I don't even know what this word is and I can't, <laughs> I can't pronounce it. So he apologized for not being able to pronounce a Native American name that was not from his region. So, right, right. And it's been a long time since we've had a, an original connection to a lot of these customs and languages and, and tribes. So you're going to get what you're going to get. So I'm just going to go back to it here. <clears throat> the Sakodan tribe that controlled Roanoke and the adjacent mainland to Amatis and Barlow were friendly and hospitable and amenable to establishing good relations. They even brought back two Native Americans with them, a Sakodan tribal member named Juan Cheese, and we did look that one up, Juan Cheese, <laughs> W-A-N-C-H-E-S-E, right. but we looked at yeah, an Algonquin be... pronunciation chart, yeah. and I, I'm pretty sure it's Juan Cheese, and okay. Monteo, possibly, but I believe North Carolinians say Manteo because right. there's a town here named for him and uh, other many other spots actually named for him, but I think yeah. they say Manteo, so I, it, I may slip in and out of the different ones. And he was a Croatan tribal member who would later become Chief Manteo and play a significant part in working with the later expeditions. And I don't know, can you imagine these two guys, they're getting on the boat, they're coming back with them and being taken to London and these are Native <laughs> Americans, that's just an experience that would be essentially, I think, you know, and I don't mean this to be disrespectful. I, you know, you get yeah. worried about what you would say these days, but to me, I feel like that would be like taking on a spaceship. You're going to see so much construction and uh, a different way of living and building and just everything around it. I, I don't know how you wouldn't be overwhelmed with it, and I don't know how you would deal with it, really. Yeah, I was thinking about that myself in that it's very poignant for them as well as the Europeans for each of them, it was a new world yeah. that they weren't sure about. Now, I would imagine because, yes, there is nature and greenery in, in Europe, of course, but it had been a long time since they'd seen it that wild in such an expanse for the Europeans coming to North America and for the native North Americans going to England and seeing everything that's been built there for thousands of years must have been mind-blowing. So, yeah, I can't imagine what it would have been like to step off the ship for the first time, get in a town. It must have seemed like an alien planet, maybe. Well, and there was a lot going on in every direction for that, because one of the things that Lawler talks about in his book was how, you know, this 19-year-old captain probably felt when they pulled up, you know, onto the shore, and these guys came out who were twice their age, and it yeah. was entirely different culture. And by the way, they were intimidating, you know, they were these sure. cause that and that's what they wanted to project was that they were strong and not afraid of these people. And so there was a lot of different exchanges going on. And what we're gonna find out here as this story unfolds too was that Juan Cheese and Mantio came back from London with apparently two very divergent viewpoints about how everyone needed to act towards these people coming from England. It unfolds like a soap opera in a lot of ways. There's a lot of characters uh, that are have uh, different motivations and different insights into what they think the future might hold for them now that England has arrived in, on the American shores. Overall, these two young captains reported that the area was beautiful and bountiful, and Queen Elizabeth I was impressed. So she awarded Raleigh, you know, even though he hadn't gone, he was the one that orchestrated this trip because she wouldn't let him leave her side. She awarded him the title of Knight, Lord, and Governor of Virginia. And that was the name she had proclaimed for this new land. Now, and I've read a bunch of different things about where that came from. She was known as the Virgin Queen, so some think it mm -hmm. came from that. There are others that thought it might have come from her trying to change the name or adapt the name of a local tribal leader, oh, Wingina. Yeah. Uh, is, yes. Gonna, yes. So we're going to be talking about him in a little bit. So there's a possibility that she took Wingina's name and changed it to Virginia. But, you know, those two things might have been unrelated to. All we can do at this point is speculate if you don't find specific documentation about that. So Raleigh now set about looking for investors to fund more exploration and actually establish a colony. Because this first thing, this was a recon mission. The idea was to go reconnoiter the situation, see if they could do something there, see if it was clear of the Spanish, and if it seemed like it would facilitate a colony that could maybe succeed and help them get a foothold in the new world. And the other thing is to remember that even though Gilbert had the charter that was north of there and was looking for a northern passage, the feeling was among the people of England and specifically Raleigh, they didn't realize how wide from east to west North America was. And there was a thought that there could be a, a northern Panama, a place where they could get goods across to the east very easily if they could just get situated in this area. So that's the other th reason that he was like, let's move forward with this. And it was a plan that the queen was aboard with. I did not realize that there were two attempts at this. 
And the first attempt was very different from the one that led to the Lost Colony. The first colony for Virginia was intended by Raleigh to be more of a scouting mission with a heavy military presence in order to take note of the land and its natural resources. So around 600 men were sent on this expedition with perhaps half that number staying to maintain the colony. A second wave of colonists were intended to be sent later. Now, Juan Chis and Mantio were on the return voyage after their visit to England, as well as artist and map maker John White and scientist, astronomer, mathematician, ethnographer, and translator Thomas Harriet. By the way, this guy was a legit genius, Harriet. Yeah, I, I want like six or seven things after my name. Yeah, I know, like, I know. Yeah. No, you don't, you, you don't get them. <laughs> Sir Ralph Lane was going to be appointed governor of this new colony. All these people have very interesting backgrounds. And Philip Amatus would be admiral of the fleet. He's probably 20 at this point. It's crazy. So he would be admiral of the fleet. And Sir Richard, Gre- and you get a title, and you get a title. And Sir Richard <laughs> Grenville yeah. would lead the expedition as fleet commander. John White was a really talented artist. His artwork is amazing. And because he was there, we are able to see exactly what the people looked like that they met when they met them. And the artist was a critical member of these excursions because there were no cameras. There was no photography. So if you wanted to document this stuff, you had to have somebody there who could translate what everyone's eyes were seeing to a record that could be kept for future generations in history and for everyone to understand. And uh, if you want to see the stuff that White did, all you have to do is Google his name in the Lost Colony and it will come up and you will just, it's really enthralling I guess when you go to a museum and you walk through and you see his kind of work hanging on the wall and you don't really think about it, but once you start to get the background and the picture, you start like, oh my God, you know, this guy went there and he drew this and this is the person that was there and it's and it's a pretty good likeness. He drew the villages as well and also wildlife. I, I There's some photo that I'm hoping we can find a picture of, um, a painting I should say, that we can find a picture of for the show where he uh, depicted a Portuguese man of war that he saw in the water. He'd never seen anything like that before, Uh which is a particularly poisonous jellyfish. Really, like as tentacles long enough to kill a man, actually. I used to worry about those when I was swimming here, <laughs> but I right. never saw one. Ah. But anyway, I digress. So uh, It's yeah. a dangerous place. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of things right off the North Carolina coast that can kill you, yeah. uh, weather <laughs> being a big one. So in light of Raleigh being commanded to operate only from London, in 1585, he, Raleigh, then tasks Sir Ralph Lane, another English explorer of the Elizabethan era, to establish a colony on Roanoke Island, which is now in Dare County, North Carolina, and only about 14 miles by road from Kill Devil Hills and Kitty Hawk of the Wright Brothers flying fame. Scott, you ever been there? No, I haven't, but I'm going. <laughs> I'm going. In like two weeks, I'm going. Well, on April 9th, 1585, Ralph Lane set sail from Plymouth, England, a port city on the south coast of Devon, where the Pilgrims would also later depart in 1620 to establish the second lasting English settlement in the New World, Plymouth Colony. So Plymouth would also be responsible for launching two historical attempts at colonization, shall we say here. Well, in this case, Lane sailed with Walter Raleigh's cousin, Sir Richard Grenville, who, as I said before, was also a soldier, explorer, privateer on his flagship, the Tiger. So he had another title on it, which is basically he he had a license to rob ships. Yeah. Which he did very well. Well, Granville was to be admiral of the expedition's fleet. The other ships in the fleet for the voyage were the Elizabeth. Of course, you got to name one after uh, your queen. The other one would be the Red Lion, the Roebuck, and the Dorothy, which was owned by Walter Raleigh himself. I think it was his personal ship, along with two pinnaces. I'm waiting here for a juvenile joke from Scott. Yeah, no, I'm not going to make it. But you knew what these were. N- right. uh, I did. A pinnace is a small boat. It's like a dinghy. It's like a glorified dinghy yeah. that you bring. Okay. So Boy, you can any go of those ashore. Are great. But uh, Sir Richard Greenville, by the way, he was about 42 when this was going on. I and see. people at that age were considered experienced. Yes, he was well-seasoned, Yes, uh, a well-seasoned sailor. This is a pinnace, so this this comes up a lot. This is spelled P-I-N-N-A-C-E-S, or A-C-E. Well, that's the, the plural, singular. yes. Yeah, exactly. It's just a small ship's boat. It'd be a boat that was attached to a ship, but sometimes these were rowed by oar, or they could have rigged sails, depending on how large they were. So a very useful, smaller thing, basically to get people from the big boat onto shore because you can't bring the big boat right up to the sand there. Yes. 
Well, while en route, the fleet encountered a treacherous storm off the coast of Portugal, and the Tiger got separated from the rest of the ships. On May 11th, the Tiger sailed into Guayanilla, Puerto Rico, and waited for the other ships to catch up. And while there, Richard Grenville built a fortress and did a little privateering against the Spanish ships, while at the same time meeting with them on good terms. <laughs> and that's the point I was going to make earlier, is that it's a lot of frenemy activity here, where you're trading on some points, you're robbing each other on others, and uh, basically you're in a state of constant war, but you're having to deal with each other without full-blown hostility. So you're, as I said, you're nipping at each other's heels and uh, stealing each other's bones. And as a reminder, a privateer is a privately owned armed ship that has been licensed by its government to attack and raid commercial ships of their cargo, uh, ships considered to belong to a country or enterprise that is on hostile terms with a privateer's country of origin. So it's your own country saying like, yeah, you can go ahead and steal from those merchant ships. It's your own country saying, you're a, uh, congratulations, you're a pirate. And it, yeah, we're going to call a you a privateer pirate. and that makes it okay. As long as you're doing it for us, you can be a pirate. Yeah, it's legal and may or may not lead to full-blown, all-out declared war, but they were doing it to each other so much, and especially to the Spanish because they were loaded with wealth. I would just say, if you want a good lesson on this, and you like old movies, and you, you want to check out Errol Flynn, Captain Blood is the movie for oh, you. Of so good, yes. and uh, you'll learn a whole lot about this. <laughs> well, the term, it can also refer to a sailor on board a privateer ship. Yes. So it's either the Enterprise or it's the actual individual there. Sir Lane and Sir Grenville did not get along at all during the voyage. No. They were not good buddies, as Lane found him to be quite the combative opportunist, describing him as having, quote, intolerable pride and insatiable ambition, end quote. Yeah, I'd like to actually read a little uh, segment about them from Lawler's book. This is on page 49 of 425. Yeah. Beneath the personal animosity pitting Lane against Grenville, some scholars perceive two rival camps that collaborated in the Roanoke voyages. The Devon cousins, Raleigh and Grenville, sought quick wealth by extracting gold and raiding Spanish ships while a second group made up of Walsingham, whom we haven't talked about yet, but we can mention uh, later, Walsingham Lane and the pilot Fernandez seemed to have favored a trading center that could provide long-term profits. The two factions formed an uneasy alliance. So what you can see here is it's really just about not agreeing on the best way to plunder something. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our old habits we like to fall back on. Yeah. Well, I think the point in pointing that out is that these journeys are fraught with tension and they're a lot of hardship to be on the sea that long. And when you get there, you face even more hardship, which is the one of the major overriding themes of this entire colony story here. But people, you know what? They were tougher back then. That's all I knew. So they put up with it. So soon after the small fort was completed, the ship Elizabeth sailed into Bay's Mosquito, or Masquital. I think it's now Guayanilla mm. in Puerto Rico. It's, I believe it's a port on the south, and Bay's Mosquito is the old, is the old name. That's, Got it. that's kind of my interpretation of that. This happened on May 19th, and so now the Elizabeth has met up with Grenville. Right. But by June 7th, Grenville had lost patience waiting for the other ships to arrive, which they never did. So now what he did was abandon the small fortress he'd built and headed for what is now Ocracoke Inlet, which is an estuary located in the outer banks of North Carolina. And as Scott briefly described before, the outer banks being a string of barrier islands and sand spits off the coast of North Carolina and southeastern Virginia, running for 200 miles and extending over most of the North Carolina coastline. When you look at pictures, if you understand, uh, if you're in the U.S. and you know the shape of North Carolina, the state, which I should hope everyone does, but uh, geography is lacking in <laughs> some people's eh, backgrounds. Of course. But if you yeah. look at the shape of North Carolina, the whole eastern border of it, not all of it, but most of it is made up of the Outer Banks. The state itself, the really solid parts of the states, is actually a very broken up and is uh, inland from the Outer Banks, which is the strip of land that, that makes up that easternmost shape of the state. Yeah, absolutely. It's dotted with a, a lot of beautiful little islands. Like I said, though, in bad weather, it can be very treacherous. And these European sailors knew a little bit about that, but they would experience it a lot more once they got there. Well, here's an example of where I wanted to point out where there were some exchanges that were semi-friendly or, or mutually beneficial between the English and the Spanish. Grenville had reached out to the local Spanish authorities 
in an attempt to trade for supplies. This is on Puerto Rico. But when the Spanish didn't deliver, he became very wary of an impending attack, which was another reason for leaving the fort when he did. Granville's ship, the Tiger, reached Ocracoke Inlet on June 26th, but ran aground on a sandbar, which ruined most of the food stores and caused heavy damage to the ship. And there's another example of it being treacherous to sail around. The other ships, the Dorothy, the Red Lion, and the Roebuck, had finally reached the Outer Banks also in late June, but the Red Lion offloaded about 30 passengers on Croatoan Island and then headed north to Newfoundland to engage in privateering. Croatoan is the word that was found on the tree. And because Uh if you're not familiar with the story, you might be, oh, so there's an island. Oh, so that's the name of the island the lost colonists must have went to, to offer a little bit of foreshadowing. However, yeah. <laughs> uh, th- there is an island called Croatoan, but as you might imagine, the story is much more complicated than that, and of course, we'll be getting to that. Anyway. Well, or will we? Or will we? Or we is might, it? We I never do. We bury the lead. We'll, we'll get to it at be, the end of part two. <laughs> <laughs> Everything can be questioned here, and that some things sound logical, but this is such new and wild territory that uh, there's a lot of mystery to it as well. And these Englishmen are sailing right into this mystery, into the unknown. Well, by the first part of July, the crew had managed to make repairs on the Tiger and then joined the Dorothy and Roebuck, and it's presumed they picked up the men left on Roanoke in the process, the men who were offloaded so the ship could go a privateering. While Grenville was on Roanoke Island, he explored the surrounding land, Pamlico Sound, and the Socotan villages, guided by Chief Manteo, or Manteo. How do you say it? Mantio. I'm pretty sure North Carolinians say Mantio. You know, I don't know, frankly. <laughs> well, that's a little, just yeah, again, again that know. just, as with all these names, I'm going to go by the one that sounds the least offensive to my ears or has a, has the nicest ring. So uh, yes. it's it's Manteo. And that's he's, by the way, he's a significant head. figure in this story and, you know, we'll be talking about him more. So don't, don't yeah, he's we're a, not brushing over him here, just to be clear. Well, his mother was chieftain of Croton Island. And eventually, I don't know if he started off as Chief Manteo, but I've seen his name with that title later on. So he may have uh, inherited the mantle from his mother or family. Now, although the native villagers weren't too interested in Grenville's presence, apparently, Thomas Harriet and John White were able to study Native American culture, and some of their surviving studies were later published. And what a great opportunity, though, at least for them, and one of the first for... Europeans to observe Native American culture and bring that knowledge back to England, back to Europe, where it was not very well known. And a lot of their data had been lost later on, but some did survive and some was published. Now, the Native American tribe on Roanoke at the time was the Aquascaguck. And boy, I hope that's right. Again, (laughs) that has the nicest ring to my ears. In this case, it's spelled A-Q-U-A, so like aqua, Mm -hmm. and then C-O-G-O-C. So to me, Aquascogoc. Yeah, there we go. Looks good. All right. Yeah, sounds good. A little cheer. I I say a little silent cheer each time I get through that. (laughs) Well, uh, this was also the name of their village. So the way it worked is that the people could be named after their village, or their village could have a separate name, and they had a different name for their particular tribe their local tribe. But in this case, the Aquascagak were part of the regional Sakotan tribes, which belonged to the larger Carolina Algonquian nation or group. So you can see how there's a larger group that they're called, and then there are smaller tribal areas. And Sakotan was the name generally that was the umbrella for a lot of these smaller specific tribes living in different areas on these islands and also on the mainland. The Algonquins, which is more of an umbrella group, it goes all the way up into Canada. That's a huge group of Native yeah. Americans to the North American region. So that's not necessarily uh, just restricted to North Carolina. I wanted to make that clear. My Quip toothbrush is a delightful part of my pre-show routine. I don't know if you know that, Scott, but I I like to have a snack and a few uh, beverages here and uh, before I start recording, but I I don't want to have a whole recording session without brushing my teeth first. That's just me. Yeah, you don't want to step up to a mic that smells like a dumpster. <laughs> well, you don't want to you don't want to step up to any person smelling like that. So it's always good to have a fresh, clean mouth. And on that note, Scott, here's a few interesting facts about dental care habits that I dug up. I thought we could play a little game here. I'll state the issue, and you tell me how Quip is the answer. Okay, let's do it. All right, here we go. Up to ninety percent of us don't brush for a full two minutes. Ding. 
Dang, I wish I wish we had a buzzer. We don't have a buzzer. Uh, the uh, answer is Quip's built-in two-minute timer pulses every 30 seconds to remind you when it's time to switch sides, and that helps you clean your whole mouth evenly. Right you are, young man. Choose anything off the bottom row here. I'll take the kazoo. <laughs> All right, next. <laughs> 75% of us use old, worn-out bristles that are ineffective. Ding! Okay. <laughs> Great. Now I wish we had a buzzer. Uh, with Quip, brush heads are automatically delivered every three months, which is on a dentist-recommended schedule for just $5. All right, very good. Would you like to trade in your kazoo for a better prize? Uh, no, I want two kazoos, please. <laughs> the interesting choice. <laughs> well, finally, many people brush too hard, and some electric toothbrushes are too abrasive. Ding, 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 ding. All right, ding. we get it, we get it, we okay. get it. Quip features sensitive sonic vibrations for an effective clean that's gentle on your sensitive gums. It makes it easy to develop good habits, like brushing for two minutes twice a day and flossing regularly, which, which you should do no matter what brand you use. Folks, the Quip Refillable Floss Dispenser comes with pre-measured strings, so you use just enough, cutting waste, any and every way possible. As we know, that's important to many of our listeners. The Quip looks good, too. Doesn't take up a lot of space. Join over 3 million healthy mouths and get Quip today, starting at just $25. Plus... Quip delivers a fresh brush head, floss, and toothpaste refills to your door every three months. That, if anything, keeps you honest. Let's get you started on better dental habits today. If you go to getquip.com slash legends right now, you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash legends. Spelled G E T. Q-U-I-P dot com slash legends. Quip, the good habits company. Forrest and Scott, thank you for supporting their sponsors. I'm Lacey. Now back to the show. Well, here's a black mark on the whole history of this initial contact, and you knew one was coming. Before Grenville and his men returned to their ship after the survey, a silver drinking cup went missing, and it was believed by them to have been stolen by the Aquascagak. Grenville sent Amadas with some soldiers to retrieve the cup from the village, and when it didn't turn up, heated words were exchanged, and it was reported that Grenville flew into a rage over the news. He then had Amadas and his men raid and burn down the entire Aquascagak village and their crops as a show of force, and calculating that it would be a future deterrent for messing with the settlers. So here's your first big outburst of violence. Yeah, in history, this is widely considered to have been an extremely bad move. It sets the stage for distrust, and it was an overreaction to a small thing. And one of the things that Lawler said in his book that I think bears repeating is that they might have thought that it was a gift, or th they might not have understood how the English were treating possessions and that things couldn't just be shared or taken or whatever. Yes. It's just, it was could have very easily been a misunderstanding. And by coming to blows over it, it was setting a, a horrible precedent for the future of all relations between the English and the Native Americans. Not that this, you know, not that if this hadn't happened, that suddenly everything would have gone great for the indigenous peoples well, when the English got here. Yeah. I, but it's still, it was, it was the first in a long series of centuries of overreactions and mistreatment of the indigenous people by the uh, the new arrivals, let's just say. Well, <laughs> or the invaders, depending on how you no, look No, to at be it. clear, look, in this history... They, of course, like anyone else, they fight between themselves, they fight newcomers, newcomers fight them, everyone's at war, everyone's brutalizing each other, and I think you're right in that eventually, if this hadn't happened, something else would have. Yeah. There would have been a dust-up somewhere else, because there was just infighting everywhere with everyone, and in this case, you can see the tactical side of the English not knowing how to deal with these people and thinking like... Well, look, we're going to make a big show of force here. They'll be so scared of us, they won't ever try anything again. And we have to do this, otherwise we look weak. And they're just going to, like, be stealing from us all the time. And once we leave, these poor colonists, who may not be armed, are going to have to deal with us all the time. But, of course, as we see later on, it was a miscalculation. The other thing I was going to point out is, imagine if you were either the Englishman who thought, like, well, no one's going to miss this silver cup, I'll just trade this out later... Or a Native American like, hey, this kind of looks cool. I think I'll just hang on to this because, right, they're, they'll be cool with that, right? And you didn't cough it up and the entire village and crops get burned because you didn't speak up, yeah. either being Native American or English and just thinking, whoops, I, uh, I probably should have just like 
stuck that back on the shelf. Yeah. So it was unfortunate, and it would not be forgotten. All right, so after that debacle, with things not exactly getting off on the right foot, it was decided that Sir Ralph Lane and 107 of the settlers would be left on Roanoke Island to build a small fort on the north end of the island and establish a colony. This was August 17th, 1585, and not long after Grenville sailed back to England with the intention of returning by April of the next year with more help and supplies since the new colonists were already short on food because of the tiger running aground. The English soon tried to establish relations with the local tribes, but were also suspicious of them and had even kidnapped a few in order to get supplies or information from them. Now, Grenville had left for England on August 25th of 1585, and on the way back had captured a Spanish galleon near Bermuda that was loaded with treasure. When he returned with the ship and its booty, it made the Roanoke colonization venture look profitable to the queen and her court, and it also made Raleigh look good. The morale of the colonists was low, as many of them had hoped to find gold and silver as the Spanish had done elsewhere in North America, but they did not. There was copper, but they never found out where the Native Americans were sourcing theirs. Partly because of the ruined food supplies of the tiger, the fall of 1585 saw the colonists relying on the local tribes to supplement their dwindling supplies with gifted corn, which would later cause tensions. They could find enough fish, deer, meat, and oysters, along with borrowed corn to sustain them through the winter, but it's likely their English supplies would have run out and the limited variety of food would also have been tedious and demoralizing. Now, Thomas Harriet, who we told you about, was kind of a genius. He'd noticed that some sort of disease epidemic had swept through each village the English had visited, which we now know may have been smallpox or the flu. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. We did not plan this episode for it to come out mm. this time of year. Mm. Hey, there's always sickness. There's you know, always, there's always sickness, epidemics. But yeah, yeah, but not like this. Not like right well, now, sure. anyway. But anyway, the sickness was thought by some of the Sakotan peoples to be caused supernaturally by the English presence. The Sakotan chief, Wingina, and that's Wing, I-N-A, uh, there's a lot uh, of different ways you can say that, but I'm going to go with Wingina. He had also become infected, but he recovered after the English had prayed for him. Wingina became convinced that the English prayers could help and asked him to visit other villages to offer prayers, but of course that just spread the disease that they brought even further. This likely affected the fall harvest, and it also decreased the food supply for the colonists who became dependent on their neighbors, and it further increased tensions between the two groups. Well, little is known about what transpired for the colonists during the winter of 1585, but the spring of the following year saw more strained relations between the English and the Sakotan peoples, probably due to the colonists always needing their food, which sowed resentment and even the threat of war. Chief Wingina, who had once been friendly to the English, started to view them as a threat, especially after the death of his brother, Granganameo. Oh, very nice. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Who was no longer providing his support for the colonists. Wingina actually changed his name to Pemisipon, meaning the one who watches, perhaps indicating his wariness now towards the English. And he tried to pit Lane and the colonists against other neighboring tribes like the Choanok and their chief, Monotonon. After a run-in engineered by Pemisipon, formerly Wingina, in which he yeah. hoped there would be a skirmish, Lane was able to take Monotonon and his son Skiko hostage and would use them for ransom and information. Pemisipon then tried to sabotage Lane's Roanoke River expedition, in which he hoped to find riches in a northwest passage, during which Pemisipon would withdraw his people and support to let the Roanoke colonists starve. But Pemisipon was surprised that Lane and his expedition had survived, and after a power shift involving nearby tribal politics and support from his elder advisor, Pemisipon decided he would help the colonists with food, at least for a short time. Then support for the English had faded after Permisipon's advisor had died, and he was once more turned against them, removing his people from Roanoke Island and refusing them of their much-needed food resources. The colonists were left to forage and beg for food where they could. Monotonan's son Skiko, who was still being held hostage, warned Lane that Permisipon was gathering a war council where he and his allies would plan to finally wipe out the colonists. Lane and his military officers, along with a contingent of 25 soldiers, arrived at the war council meeting at Dasamangaponk, claiming to want to broker a deal for Skiko's release. Instead, they attacked 
and shot Pomisipon, who was able to escape into the woods, but only until Lane's men caught up with him. Pomisipon's head would later be displayed on a pike outside of the Roanoke Fort. So it's getting a little extreme, but uh, yeah. yeah. So, and it's interesting to me too, when you think about this, the settlers are coming there, they're trying to establish a colony and they're so ill-prepared and unable to do it that the only way they can do it is by borrowing and getting help from the people that ultimately they're planning to conquer. Yeah, I guess you could look at it this way. I mean, of course, it's not such an alien planet that they're going to that they don't know how the soil works or how to sow crops. I think it's partly that they they didn't know about the terrain and conditions and they were not completely prepared as much as they could have been. It's an expedition where, yes, they had some supplies. They knew what they would be needing. It's not like you know they traveled back in time and suddenly they have to fend for themselves and there's no restaurants or a Costco around for them to get supplies. Obviously, they've done this before, but they ran into some problems with the tiger running aground. So that depleted a lot of their stores. They were starting off on a bad foot. And I think it's one of those things where they start to borrow. It's like, hey, can we get some more corn? You don't need it, right? They keep keep asking and asking, and uh, they're always needing help. So the, the point here is I think the conditions were miserable, And I think overall, the Native Americans started to resent the English presence because it made them miserable having these guys hanging around all the time asking for all their food. Well, at this point, the colonists have become the thing that wouldn't leave. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, they're not going back now. I mean, somebody was going to colonize it at some point. It wouldn't stay a secret for long. So if it wasn't the English, you'd have the Spanish there. If not the Spanish, you'd have the French there. Somebody was going to show up eventually and be a real bother in the very slightest sense to the Native Americans there who were going through their own problems intertribally with each other for power and control, and they had their usual things going on, but they were they were fine. That was enough for them. But now they have these foreigners to deal with. So what you see here, though, is that initial brutality is met with more brutality, and then it's that classic endless cycle of violence. Well, by April of 1586, Grenville had not returned, as promised, and the sacking and burning of the Aquascagoc village because of the missing silver cup had not been forgotten, and the colonists had to repel a retaliatory attack on the fort. However, by June, Sir Francis Drake had arrived at Roanoke Island while traveling back to England after successful military campaigns at the Battle of Santo Domingo in the present-day Dominican Republic, and the Battle of Cartagena de Indias, and the raid on St. Augustine. See, everything's connected. It all comes back to uh, all of that St. Augustine and everything. So that's where Drake had taken possession of slaves and metal hardware and war refugees, which he was going to leave with the Roanoke colony to help out. And the other thing that Drake was doing, the other reason he was stopping is because he was friends with Raleigh. And he he knew Mm -hmm. that helping Raleigh would make sense. And he also knew that he would be reimbursed or rewarded for assisting with the colony at this point. Once Drake had landed and heard about all their troubles, he was also going to leave behind four months of supplies and a ship from his fleet, the Francis. But that ship was unfortunately swept out to sea after a hurricane. This was a brutal storm. It lasted for three days. Man, you and you North Carolinians in your storm. Yeah, the hurricanes. I'll tell you what, though. I'll take them any day of the week over an earthquake because you know what? (laughs) Back then they didn't. Uh But these days, you know it's coming. You know it's coming. Unlike the earthquake, which just happens whenever it wants. Yeah. So once a storm had passed, Drake offered to take Ralph Lane and the settlers to sail back to England with him, and Lane urged his men to take the offer. They gladly accepted due to the miserable conditions brought on by the food shortage and the ongoing hostilities with the locals. Chief Mantio and his friend Towe also went on the return voyage, accompanying the men. Three of the colonists stayed behind for unknown reasons— <laughs> And were never heard from again. And when Lawler talks about these three, he says it's not really clear whether they just couldn't find them or they refused to join or, you know, it's like in the bounty. There were a few of those uh, mutineers. They were like, yeah, we're staying here. I just watched that, uh, the bounty the other day, the Anthony Hopkins one. And one of the things they talked about, and I, I later went on to read this online, was about these guys that wanted to stay behind. They refused to come when the mutineers left Tahiti after they went back the first time. They went back after marooning Captain Bly, and they went back to Tahiti, and some of the people stayed behind. But when you read about what happened to those ones that stayed behind, 
they just got like immediately killed or something. So it's, well, that's <laughs> that's usually what um, happens. Stick, stick you know, with the, your uh, group. Please stay with your groups. That reminded me exactly of a. Uh, this is 1580 to 1590. Here, you really don't know what went on other than the reports that were sent back. And as we always say, even people's personal reports of eyewitness accounts and people who were there. Maybe they don't have all the facts right, or the actual intentions of people have been shaded, because that happens to me. <laughs> I'll have friends that have said, uh, well, you meant this. It's like, I didn't mean that at all. Well, I mean, not completely. Like, the, people don't really get exactly what's going on, so we don't know why. But I was going to say, it reminds me of the plot of a Twilight Zone I recently saw called On Thursday We Leave for Home, about a marooned space mission uh, starring James Whitmore, where they get rescued, but he doesn't want to go, even though it's horribly miserable there, because he's in charge of everything, and he feels responsible, and that's what he knows. The first thing I love about this story is that you were recently watching a Twilight Zone. Do you just sit around and watch Twilight Zones? There was a marathon around New Year's. That's what it was on uh, one of the old uh, nostalgia shows there. So they were they were running around the clock for like two days. That's awesome. Yeah. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't sit there for two days, but I, I caught that one. And you wonder, it's like, why is he doing this? Everybody, they're miserable. They want to leave. They've been there for 30 years just surviving and getting by. And it's being horrible, but that's what he knows. Yeah. There is also no record of what happened to a portion of the refugees and the slaves that Drake left behind. And also, it's not really clear if he left them behind. This is where things get really weird. There's no record of them returning with Drake's fleet, and it's possible they remained on Roanoke with some of Drake's supplies. To that end, I want to read an excerpt from Lawler's book, The Secret Token, about these people that also seem like they may have vanished. And if they did... This would have been before the lost colony vanished. Oh, and I wanted to say one other thing about that storm. That One of the tragedies about that storm, which they described as uh, extraordinary and strange, and I think it's just because they had never been exposed to a hurricane, one of the great tragedies about it was that Harriet, the gentleman who was the scientist and so brilliant, he had developed a whole dictionary of Algonquin language. All of his work that he had been doing, or most of it, was lost in that storm. Things were uh, thrown overboard or lost in the water. And that is just a, a great tragedy of right. solid, amazing information lost to history. And it could be also part of the reason that the documentation is sketchy about what was happening there was because the storm came and just nearly wiped them all out. Yeah. But here, let's come back around again to those folks that seem to have vanished. I want to read this passage from Lawler's book that really stood out to me. This is really fascinating. This is from page uh, 76 of... The Secret Token by Andrew Lawler. The most fascinating and unresolved question about the Lane Colony is the fate of the hundreds of refugees on Drake's fleet when it arrived at Roanoke. Most of those from the Ottoman Empire, Spain's mortal enemy, returned to England and were repatriated. Less than a week after the ships arrived in England, the Queen's Privy Council noted 100 Turks brought by Sir Francis Drake out of the West Indies, where they served as slaves in the Spanish galleys. But only one black African is recorded as arriving with the fleet, and he apparently did not see the English as saviors. He immediately fled for France and sought sanctuary with the Spanish ambassador. An English diplomat in Paris wrote Walsingham that the man had a cut on his face and claimed to have returned from the New World. He added that he would be glad to hear whether any such hath escaped away from Sir Francis Drake or not. Nothing more has been found in British archives to answer this query. As to what happened to the remaining Africans and South Americans, and I'm just going to interject here, it was clear that he had Africans and South Americans that had come with him from the cities that he had plundered or that he had taken. But the point is that only the Turks and one black man returned to London. So the question is, where did these other folks go? Coming back into Lawler's text, as to what happened to the remaining Africans and South Americans, quote, the saddest part of the story and perhaps the most revealing is that no one bothered to say, end quote, notes historian Edmund Morgan. It is unlikely Drake brought hundreds of slaves to London in the 1580s, given the limited market there for humans in bondage. There are also no records of a large sale after his return. Some might have drowned in the hurricane off the Outer Banks, though there is no mention of casualties. And while a crew might dump slaves into the ocean if supplies dwindled, there is no evidence that Drake committed or countenanced such acts. Though quick to kill mutineers, Spanish soldiers, and Irish rebels, 
the admiral did not have a reputation for indiscriminate slaughter for no obvious gain. Quote, the only reasonable explanation is that a considerable number of Indians and Negroes were put ashore on the Carolina Outer Banks and equipped with the pots and pans, locks and bolts, boats and launches of St. Augustine, end quote, concludes David Beers Quinn, the late University of Liverpool historian and dean of Roanoke researchers. So that's the point he's making, because these guys had been with Drake since he came from St. Augustine. So Grenville doesn't mention seeing anyone during his brief stopover, save for the three Indians he kidnapped. If the refugees were left on Roanoke, however, they would surely have scattered with the appearance of European sails to avoid detection and a potential return to slavery. Native Americans may have absorbed them. Whether they would have made their presence known to the lost colonists who arrived a year later, or even made common cause with them, is unknown. But these scores, perhaps hundreds of West Africans, Native South Americans, and North African Moors, form a mysterious other lost colony, one that left an even thinner paper trail than their English counterparts. Their presence on Roanoke would mean that the bulk of the first permanent settlers of England's initial New World colony were neither Christian nor European, but North African Muslims as well as followers of West African and South American traditions. To this day, rumors persist from eastern North Carolina to the Appalachians of an influx of southern Mediterranean people predating the English settlements. They might have been remnants of Ilon's colony, which we haven't mentioned yet, or other Spanish and French expeditions. These are just earlier attempts at colonization that we haven't talked about. Or castaways from shipwrecks. Yet Quinn notes the strong possibility that the refugees from Drake's fleet were, quote, left to form an isolated colony in what is now North Carolina, end quote. If they did, then they were soon joined by a fresh batch of Europeans intent on making Virginia their home. Hmm. I just think that's really fascinating. I mean, this is up to 100 folks that just disappeared. and Or that, they got assimilated or blended in or, or blended something in. happened. Yeah. I mean, it's, in a way, it's still a disappearance if you've got no records, I guess. Yeah. But, um, right. And that's before the lost colony is technically lost. So it was July 28th of 1586 that Francis Drake arrived at Portsmouth, and the Roanoke settlers had brought with them new items like tobacco or snuff, uh, potatoes and corn to England. And uh, when he arrived at that trip, that's when the those hundred Turks disembarked, but the other folks were not there, which is what we just talked about. Within a few days after Drake, Lane, and the settlers had departed for England, a lone supply ship that had been sent by Raleigh arrived at the island. But since the crew couldn't find any trace of the settlers, they left. Richard Grenville finally arrived about two weeks later with 400 men and a year's supplies, but also found the colony abandoned. One native under interrogation had told Grenville about the evacuation, And hearing this, Grenville then decided to also return to England, taking with him most of his military force, but leaving behind 15 experienced soldiers to guard Walter Raleigh's claim on the Virginia Territory in the New World with an English presence. So that pretty much sums up the first colony that they tried to do there. Things didn't quite go as planned. There was some fighting, and then everybody (laughs) left. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, it's not easy, yeah. uh, colonization, and it certainly looked upon unfavorable today in the course of history. Someone's going to do it, and no matter how tough it is, they're going to keep at it because that's just how people are. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying somebody's going to keep at it, and that's what happened here. There was a second attempt at a Virginia colony. Virginia, of course, being the name given to the entire Carolina region, as well as what they know of the entire North American East Coast at this point, except for Spanish Florida. Yeah, everything was Virginia. It was all (laughs) Virginia. That comes back to the idea of, let's claim this huge piece of land, we're going to call it this, and then we'll break it up and figure out how to manage it more rationally later. Yeah, exactly. So when you first read this or read about it, you might be a little confused because uh, in modern times here, we're thinking of the state. Right. And that, oh, they went to Virginia State? Like, well, no, the whole region is as they knew it, that this new country was Virginia. Yes. So this second attempt was approved by Sir Walter Raleigh, even though Roanoke was deserted in failure. And uh, he was largely convinced by people like John White, Thomas Harriet, and Richard Hacklett that the endeavor was worthwhile. He should keep at this. So Raleigh approved the charter for the founding of the 
City of Raleigh. That's, of course, city spelled C-I-T-T-I-E in the Old English yes. manner of spelling it with too many consonants. <laughs> so this charter for the new city of Raleigh was approved on January 7th, 1587. John White was to be the governor along with 12 assistants and around 115 settlers, this time mostly middle-class Londoners looking for a new start and perhaps hoping to become landowners in the new world, the landed gentry, they had agreed to come on the voyage. Two of them being John White's daughter, Eleanor, who was pregnant at the time, and her husband, Ananias Dare. Chief Manteo, uh, actually, I don't know if he was still chief by this time, but he was, I think he was chief at some point. I've seen that uh, title associated with him. Chief Manteo, or Manteo, and his associate, Toye, also returned on this voyage as they had left with Drake during the last evacuation. So they're coming back. I just want to say that earlier I called that guy Toway. That's okay. Toway. <laughs> You know, it's like I don't know if the uh, yeah, toe-way. I don't know if the uh, sounds vowels. much better, more respectable. I'm, I'm with that. No, that's fine. We're trying our best here, and and again, we really tried to make a good effort at finding pronunciations online. Just weren't there. Yes. Now there were some women and children along with the group, but there was no military unit, no formal one anyway. John White and the aspiring colonists left England on May 8th with White as captain of the flagship Lion and Simon Fernandez acting as pilot and master of the Lion. There was also a flyboat, which is a smaller, fast ship, and then the third ship was a fully rigged pinnace. The flagship Lion and the pinnace reached Hatteras Island on July 22nd, and the plan was for John White to take 40 men ashore to Roanoke to check on the 15 soldiers left there by Grenville before they would all continue onto Chesapeake Bay, which is at the coasts of present-day Maryland and Virginia. Since that was suggested by Richard Hacklett that it should be the new site for a colony, mostly because Hacklett thought it might be closer to a northwest passage to the Pacific Ocean. Again, that's a big goal there. Not only gold and riches, and maybe there's cities like the Spanish had encountered, uh, cities of gold and lots of wealth as the Spanish had encountered in South America, they still had hopes, the English did, that maybe there's something like that in North America. And maybe it's not as wide as it actually turns out to be. Maybe the Pacific Ocean is just beyond the unexplored territory. So let's start up in Chesapeake. There is also another reason that uh, the calmer and cooler and smarter heads thought that Chesapeake would be a better site. And that's because of the fighting between Lane's men and the Sakotan, and of course the beheading of Pemisopan, formerly Wingina. And so Roanoke would be a much less safe place for the settlers. When it comes to all-in-one website builders, there's really no better choice than Squarespace. Whether you're setting up your first website for your online business, maybe you're a blogger looking to publish original content and showcase your work, you must check out Squarespace. There are a million reasons to have a custom website that showcases your work, your talents, and uniqueness. It's essential, really. If you are a small business owner, like an architect or a landscaper, uh, perhaps you opened a small wedding venue. Maybe you're a jewelry designer. The list goes on and on. I think what prohibits most people from doing it is that they think they need to hire an expensive web designer or, or they need to know how to write code. And I think you're absolutely right, but nothing could be further from the truth. Squarespace makes building a custom website so accessible. I, I guess you could say that anyone, even you, Scott, can turn a cool idea into a website. Thanks a lot. Well, mm -hmm. they offer beautiful templates designed by world-class talent, but I'd like to add that everything is customizable. So with just a few simple clicks, you can control the look and feel of your site. If you do need powerful e-commerce functionality, look no further. If you're looking to integrate an online store and need marketing tools at your fingertips, Squarespace has you covered. With their new email campaign feature, Squarespace will help you stand out in any inbox. From your homepage to your emails, this platform makes it easy to unify your brand voice. All the experts say being consistent with your brand is essential. Well, powerful editing tools are made available on your desktop or mobile device, so feel free to explore and customize message layouts, even announcements, and send anywhere, anytime. Don't forget, it's not always about selling things. Sometimes it's about selling you. And this is an effective way to control what people see, how they come to know you, especially if you are in the job market. It's a way to highlight your talents, your interests. Best part, everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box. 
Squarespace is a new way to buy domains. Choose from over 200 extensions. If you need analytics to help you grow in real time, they got them. Built-in search engine optimization to help potential clients discover you. Nothing to patch or upgrade ever. All of this includes free and secure hosting along with their award-winning customer support 24-7. So what's stopping you? Check out squarespace.com legends for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Once again, go to squarespace.com legends for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code legends to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. This is Patrick. Thank you for listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. So now we've come to one of the pinnacle events in this history and also one of the more baffling ones. And Scott and I were talking about this before we started to record because it's a little hard to understand the logic of what happened. When John White boarded the pinnace with 40 men, someone who was described as a quote unquote gentleman, someone who claimed to represent the master and pilot Simon Fernandez. Now keep in mind, a pilot of a ship or master of the ship has a lot of power. Yes. Next to the captain. They basically are, it's like the, the COO, they're the chief operating officer of the boat in a way. And someone with some authority, not Fernandez himself, and maybe I guess it was suggested that Fernandez had this person do his dirty work. Someone had ordered the sailors aboard the flagship to leave the colonists on Roanoke. You know what? I want to read a little passage on this too from Lawler's book. Mm -hmm. This is on page 89. What took place next is one of the most mystifying moments in early American history. As a party of settlers led by White boarded the pinnace for the short trip across the Pamlico Sound to Roanoke, a gentleman, this is in quotes, a gentleman by the means of Fernandez, end quotes, sent it would seem as a messenger to do the pilot's dirty work, called to the sailors in the pinnace. This unnamed person, who was appointed to return to England, leaned over the flagship's rail and ordered the pinnace crew not to bring any of the settlers back again, but leave them in the island, except the governor and two or three such as he approved, saying that the summer was far spent, wherefore he would land all the planters in no other place, end quote. Why would they make that decision to dump them there? It's hard to say, and this is, uh, Lawler goes on to say, by meekly accepting this decision, White helped to undermine the entire venture. He goes on to add, Wingina's assassination the previous year by Lane and his men made Roanoke Island a dangerous place for the English, as the new governor would have heard firsthand from Harriet. The Europeans had been welcomed warmly during the first two voyages, but could now expect quite different treatment. Ever since, historians have chastised White for weak leadership and lambasted Fernandez for his betrayal of Raleigh and the innocent colonists, a view that lay unchallenged for centuries. After conceding the fight to Fernandez, White and his ill-fated party arrived on Roanoke at sunset and made camp. The next morning, they walked warily to the Iron's north end, where Master Ralph Lane had his fort. The settlement was strangely quiet. None of the 15 men Grenville had left behind were to be found, alive at least. There was a set of bleached bones of a person which the savages had slain long before. The fort was razed down or dismantled while the houses stood intact but vacant. Deer grazed on melons that had grown up in the ruins. Making the best of a bad situation, White ordered the settlers to repair the existing homes and build new cottages. The strange thing here is that they knew from past experience and reports that had been given to them, everyone who was in charge should have known that you were placing these settlers in grave danger now, or at least increased danger, rather than taking them up to Chesapeake Bay. So it's, you're willfully leaving them in danger. White and the party did locate Lane's old colony, and they, yeah, they found it was dismantled, houses were empty, things were overgrown, and the only thing that they found in the ground were some bones here. That was the only sign of the 15 men. Now, the Croatans would later tell Chief Manteo that the 15 soldiers had been attacked in an ambush just after Granville left by an alliance of mainland tribes made up of Sakotan, Akwaskagak, and Dasamangeponke, 
I'm not sure. Again, that's the hardest one I've encountered yeah, that here. That's the that hardest. Day. <laughs> Just that looks like you were cleaning your keyboard. That one. No, that's the one I, I remember. I mentioned <laughs> earlier on, yeah. uh, on at the beginning of the show. Yeah. Uh, this uh, Native American gentleman called Ask an Injun on YouTube. He's like, I I don't know what this is. <laughs> and he just and he gets it far worse than I do. And he he uh, comically apologizes for uh, for not getting it. But it's D A S A M O N G U E P O N K E. Das das a mongo mongo punke. Punke. Das yeah. a mongo punke. Okay. Yeah. Mongo punke. Okay. Well, mostly these three tribes, their warriors were led by Juan Chis. Yeah. Remember him? If you yeah. remember, he was the one on the return voyage of the first Amadas Barlow expedition back to England. So over the years, he'd gotten to know the English and he grew to distrust them and dislike them. But also he had become one of Wingina's or Permisipan's senior advisors helping to sour the chief's attitude toward the colonists. And perhaps they had just finally gotten revenge for Glenville's burning of the Aquascagoc village over the Silver Cup incident. So as the story goes, two natives approach the contingent's camp, and that would be the 15 soldiers that were left behind. Yes. And they asked to speak peacefully with two of the English soldiers. One soldier was killed by a wooden sword concealed by a warrior, while the other Englishmen fled to warn the others as 28 more native warriors appeared. The native warriors set fire to the food stores at the English camp with flaming arrows, and another English soldier was killed. Nine soldiers fled to the shore and escaped in a boat. As they were leaving on their way to Port Ferdinando, they found their other four unit members who were out collecting oysters picked them up, and the remaining 13 survivors went missing after that. Never to be heard from again. Yeah, so that's another 13 guys that might have just vanished at sea, for all we know. Or they went somewhere else and just lived their lives Blended out. in. We don't know who they <laughs> deserted. are. Deserted. Yeah, they're just, yeah. they disappear from history. Well, the flyboat had arrived on July 25th, and the colonists all disembarked in this area. And one of those colonists, George Howe, he was the, uh, thought to be the assigned artist for the group, just like John White had been the first time, ill-advisedly went on a walk by himself a few miles down the coast and decided to take his clothes off, wade out into the water, and spear crabs in the Albemarle Sound. He was spotted by some natives who then shot, I think, 16 arrows into him. Mm, and yeah. after that, they crushed his skull with a wooden sword. White sent Edward Stafford, the captain of the pinnace, and Mantio to try and patch up relations with the Croatan and through them seek peace with other tribes. They offered a truce, which was to be relayed to the other tribes via the Croatan, but didn't hear back. White took this as a bad sign and then decided to attack the Dasamangwapanke village as a preemptive measure. But since the villagers knew the English might come looking for revenge for the murder of George Howe on the beach, they had all cleared out. Unfortunately, White and his men ended up attacking the more friendly Croatan tribal members who were just looting the abandoned village. So this is a friendly fire situation. And you may remember some time ago, I can't remember who it was, maybe it was Manteo or... Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody who was like, can you just give us something we can wear so you'll know it's us? And <laughs> yeah. uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that did not happen. The mm -hmm. English once again needed the help of Manteo in easing tensions. They did realize how helpful Manteo had been all along with their efforts, and later Manteo would convert to Christianity, be baptized, and awarded the title of Lord of Roanoke and Dasamangwapanke. Governor John White's daughter... Eleanor Dare, who was pregnant on the voyage over, gave birth to a daughter on August 18, 1587, who would be named Virginia Dare, with her Christian name of Virginia symbolizing being the first Christian born in Virginia. And in fact, she was the first British subject born on territory held in the New World by the yeah. English. So that's she was the very first one there that was born on that soil. Although no one really knows the history of Virginia Dare, the person, her name has gone on to become symbolic for many special interest groups, not all of them ones that probably would want to be, <laughs> she would want to be associated with. But you know, we don't know. We don't know anything about her because she was just a baby. The only thing we know is that she was born. And after right. that, she disappeared. Well, so. it's the same with another colonist woman, Marjorie Harvey. Yeah. She had a child not long after Virginia Dare was born, but we don't know much about 
her child either. Yeah, we don't even know what sex it was. That wasn't even recorded, according to Lawler. People have taken up the mantle of the name Virginia Dare for their own purposes just because of the fact that she was the first child born of English heritage. And some would make a point of the first Christian child born in the New World. So we're not even sure what happened to her. She may have grown up to live a full, uh, rich life just off the record and into the interior of the country. Yes, off the super well-informed and uh, (laughs) well-kept and filed away records of this time period. In yeah, <laughs> off the right. Bed. I think just when you step off the boat, you're off the record. Back then, <laughs> uh, boy, unless somebody reports on you and and returns to uh, England with a report, or somebody there keeps it and that record is preserved, you don't really know. You just go on about your life and and you keep living it as so many indigenous peoples have. They just go on about their life. Yeah, and the, and the other thing to reiterate here is that uh, Virginia Dare was John White's granddaughter. And he was yes. the governor this time. The first colony that he had come on, he had been the artist that had been responsible for documenting things and also been involved at higher levels. But now he's the governor. This is his project, which is why he brought his own artist, who was the one that went crab fishing and got shot to death <laughs> yeah. three days after he arrived. So well, yeah. there you have it. <laughs> so by August, the colonists were preparing to move the colony to the Albemarle Sound and had asked John White to return to England with the fleet so he could plead their case and bring back help. White was reluctant to leave them, especially his daughter and new granddaughter, but he did join the return voyage home on August 27th of 1587. He reached England on November 5th, 1587, but political and circumstantial factors did not permit him to return to Roanoke for three years. So Mm -hmm. that's a long time for people who are sort of just getting started back there. That was a difficult journey getting back there. Not every journey across the Atlantic, as they say, is smooth sailing, literally. So he left in August, at the end of August, didn't get to England until November 5th. Yeah, what took longer to go there than it did to come the other way. Right. That much I do know. Rough seas, and he gets there, and then what happens essentially is that Queen Elizabeth has now prohibited any able ship from leaving England, so they might be available in defending against an attack by the Spanish Armada. Which was 130 ships. Yeah. 130 ships, the Spanish Armada. Right. Well, John White had hoped to sail with Richard Grenville in March of 1588 in a resupply ship for Roanoke, since Grenville had been given permission to attack the Spanish in the Caribbean. But eventually, Grenville was ordered to stay and help defend England. So White had then hoped to use two of Grenville's ships to resupply Roanoke, but those ships were attacked by French pirates, with many of the crew killed and supplies for Roanoke stolen. So tons of piracy and killing on them high seas. Really treacherous place out there. And it wouldn't be until 1590, after the Spanish Armada was defeated, that White would get permission to send another supply ship to Roanoke. He left the colonists. On August 27th, 1587, he did not get back to Roanoke until 1590. Yeah, exactly. Well, coming back to author Andrew Lawler, the gentleman who wrote The Secret Token, the the book that we keep uh, talking about, Walter Raleigh Uh, was now looking for new investors to take over the Virginia Colony Enterprise. But he also managed to finally make arrangements for John White to get back to Roanoke. Now, the plan was for White to sail with a fleet of six ships that would go on a privateering mission to raid Spanish outposts in the Caribbean during the summer of 1590. And at some point during this expedition, the ships Hopewell and Moonlight would diverge from the fleet and take White to Roanoke for a relief mission. He couldn't get a straight trip over there, so this was what he had to do. Well, what was happening during this time in 1590 was that the Spanish had led the English to believe that they were planning on destroying the Roanoke colony in order to set up their own colony in Chesapeake Bay. But this rumor turned out to be intelligence misdirection here. 16th century spycraft here. That's right. A bit of uh, disseminating misinformation here. Since Grenville's capture of the Spanish galleon treasure ship, the Santa Maria de San Vicente in 1585, The Hall of Booty in Bermuda that, if you remember, made Queen Elizabeth's court think the Virginia colony venture was profitable. The Spanish had become aware of the Roanoke colony and were trying to gather intelligence on it. And just another side note on here, Grenville, when he captured that Spanish ship, he was going to later take it to Bideford in England and convert it into the Galleon Dudley. And I guess a cannon from that Spanish ship 
is located there in Bideford's Victoria Park, but it's erroneously labeled Armada Cannons. Oh. Well, Isn't that cool? Go. You can go see uh, one of the cannons off that ship he took. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So they were wary that the English were trying to set up a base for piracy and privateering in the North American territories, but they never found any evidence of working piracy operations there. The Spanish were unaware that the first Ralph Lane colony had been abandoned and a second attempt at a colony with John White had been established at the same location. They incorrectly assumed that the English exploration and colonies were much more successful than they actually were, fueled by rumors such as the English finally discovering the mythic Northwest Passage to the Pacific Ocean and that along the way they had found a massive treasure like something like a, a mountain made of diamonds yeah a mountain made of diamonds that's what Lawler actually says that phrase in his book so that must have been what they thought was happening which would be quite a fight it's just funny how uh, I mean the Spanish were so wealthy one of the, the historic rumors I'd heard what was that the Spanish were so wealthy from the haul of gold they made out of the Americas that not a lot of work was done for like three years in Spain. They were just like, just gold everywhere. <laughs> so a Spanish reconnaissance mission in 1587 was thwarted. So in 1588, King Philip II ordered former Spanish Florida territory governor Vicente Gonzalez to search Chesapeake Bay for an English pirate base. Gonzalez found nothing in the bay, but as he was leaving, he did spot Port Ferdinando at the Outer Banks. And as a reminder here, Simon Fernandez was the pilot of the larger ship commanded by Philip Amadas on the Amadas Barlow expedition we talked about previously. And since he sighted the inlet where that expedition made landfall north of Hatteras Island, it was named Port Ferdinando after him. John White may have been on that same original expedition, but there are no surviving records to prove this. So Port Ferdinando and Roanoke Island appeared abandoned to him, Gonzalez. So Gonzalez left the area without investigating further. The Spanish believe Gonzalez may have discovered the English base, but since their armada was defeated in July of 1588, they were prevented from attacking it immediately. On August 12th in 1590, the flagship Hopewell and the Moonlight anchored just off of Croatone Island. While the ship's crews were anchored off the north end of Hatteras Island on the evening of the 15th, they spotted smoke rising from Roanoke Island. The next morning, they spotted plumes of smoke rising from the south end of Hatteras Island, but upon investigating further, they found nothing. Over the next two days, the landing party headed by John White had a hard time trying to cross the Pamico Sound, and um, in fact, a few of the crew had died in the crossing. And what you have to remember here is that these guys are really just kind of giving him a ride. They weren't fully vested in this. They were, That's true, you yeah. know, they had been doing pirating and whatever else. And they're like, all right, we'll take you up there. And yeah. um, they wanted to get back to the booty. I mean, not to make a, a joke here, but that's what their task was. That's what their mission was, was to rob Spanish treasure yes. in the Caribbean. This was kind of an offshoot that they were tasked with. One might say that the booty called to them. I was not clever enough to get that in, but thank you for doing that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, some of them died. I mean, it's treacherous waters there, even with this just trying to go ashore. And when some of them died, a lot of them got a little freaked out. But he really wanted to make sure that they were doing their level best to find these colonists, especially considering it was his daughter and granddaughter. So... The landing party actually reached the north end of Roanoke Island on August 17th, and they spotted a large fire through the woods and started rowing towards it. But since it was after nightfall, they decided it was too risky to come ashore. They spent the night in their boats singing English songs loudly and playing a trumpet, hoping that any colonist that might hear them would respond and give them hope. Lawler in his book actually talks about how bizarre it must have been for them having lost a bunch of their comrades and now they're sitting in this boat, like, singing English songs into the night just to protect themselves, but also try to get the attention of the colonists if they're actually there. you got to remember, they've been gone for three years. So yeah. they're not even sure yeah. they're in the right spot. And they can't really be sure who is starting these fires and where the smoke signals are coming from. So, Yeah, I mean, this is leading up to the disappearance, the discovery of the disappearance is really so tragic. And it's one thing that I wanted to point out, and I know we're making light of booty and all, but just the crossing of Pamlico Sound was so treacherous that I believe seven of the, the ship's other crew, the Midnight, had drowned in the surf off the shoals there because the waves had picked up so much. Didn't it overturn one of the boats? Yeah, it was pretty bad. In fact, there's a little section here I can read about that in... Lawler's book that will give you a, a pretty good idea of how dangerous it was. Here, let's see. Um, 
this is from page seven, Roman numeral seven, in his uh, prelude to the book. It's right up at the top of the book. Uh, again, I can't recommend this book enough. It's so uh, fun to read, exciting, and interesting. A boat was sent ashore early the next morning to collect more fresh water, and it was 10 in the morning before White could launch a second attempt to reach Roanoke. By now, the ocean had turned rough. The governor set off again with the captain of the Hopewell. As they neared the inlet into the Pamlico, we had a sea break into our boat, which filled us half with water, White reports. The soaked crew landed safely on the Hatteras shore, though all their provisions were spoiled and the gunpowder wet. Worse was to follow. As the men made it to land, the wind blew at northeast and direct into the harbor so great a gale that the sea broke extremely on the bar, and the tide went very forcibly at the entrance. The surge caught the second boat carrying a crew from the moonlight just as it entered the inlet. The men on the beach watched helplessly as a wave overturned the vessel on a submerged sandbar, tossing the sailors into the foaming water. The surf pounded those who clung to the gunnels. Some tried to wade to safety, but the water, quote, beat them down so that they could neither stand nor swim, and the boat twice or thrice was turned the keel upward, end quote. White watched helplessly as the captain and master's mate of the moonlight clutched the boat until they sunk and were seen no more. Several of the crew members of the first boat then stripped and dashed into the treacherous seas, but they were only able to rescue four of the 11 people. This next uh, sentence captures the disposition of these men at this point. The mischance did so much discomfort the sailors that they were all of one mind not to go any further to seek the planters, being the colonists. Only an impassioned plea by White and the stern command of the Hopewell captain persuaded the men to continue the quest. So... Wow. And that's kind of setting the stage there. I mean, they're having problems just getting their little boats ashore. Put your mindset to that of what it must have been like for John White, the governor. His only daughter and his toddler granddaughter were possibly somewhere on that island. They just watched seven crew members drown in the surf, unable to help them. And that night, they're in that boat by themselves, knowing nothing and trying to sing songs to keep up their their morale, and also possibly provide hope as well to any colonists that were on shore. Yeah. Just the mood. I mean, yeah, it's just, it's hard to imagine, but that's one thing that we like to cover in history is, you know, these were people with the same hopes and dreams and, and uh, desires that we have now and how you would feel in their place and just how defeating that must feel. Yeah, I can't even imagine. And then on top of that, to throw into the mix of it, just this huge unknown land that you're at. Yeah. Like, you have no idea, you may as well be on an alien planet, you know, for to, to a certain extent. I mean, obviously they were familiar with the territory south where the Spanish had conquered and built St. Augustine and everything, but this was uncharted territory, which is why they were afraid to go ashore at night. It's all dangerous, it's mysterious, it's all into the unknown, and such a rough start for England in America. Well, the next morning on the 18th, which would have been his granddaughter Virginia Dare's third birthday, it would have been her birthday, White and his party found fresh tracks left by Native Americans in the sand, but they were not contacted by any natives, and there is no evidence that White attempted to or was able to contact any Croatoan natives for information. When the party reached the colony, they found that the site had been fortified with palisades, and upon one of the posts near the entrance was carved the word Croatoan, C-R-O-A-T-O-A-N. They also found the letters C-R-O carved into another tree nearby. And White was somewhat relieved, believing these carvings meant that the colonists, or planters as they called them, had safely just relocated to Croatoan Island sometime during the three years of his absence. Nowadays, Croatoan Island is known as Hatteras Island, and White had made an agreement with the settlers in 1587 before he left that if they had left for another location, they should carve the name of the new site somewhere nearby as a secret token, which is thus the name of Lawler's book. Yes. Did you, <laughs> I just today got that. You just put that together. What, what, what is well, a secret I, I saw, token? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw a secret token, and it's like, yeah. oh, that's what author Lawler meant. Yes, okay. that's what he meant. So it's a secret token. And if they were in trouble, they were supposed to have carved a Maltese cross, or some say a cross pate onto a nearby tree, signaling that they had been forced to leave under duress. I had read descriptions that it was the two different types of crosses. A Maltese cross is, picture this as like four arrowhead points, all with the tips meeting at the center. That would be a general description of a Maltese cross. 
the cross pate would be something that you would see like the Iron Cross right. in World War One with the Germans. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, with the flaring uh, edges on there. And But in any case, they were supposed to carve some symbol of a cross into a nearby tree so that it could be seen by any rescuers or relief mission and know that they were in trouble. They had to leave quickly to get out of there to save their lives. Yeah, and White figured it made sense that they had just moved to Croton Island since they had maps showing both islands and the colonists had stayed there before and the local Croton tribe was friendly to the English. Now, this island is just 50 miles to the south, so yeah. it's it's not in eyesight, but it's only a day's trip to get there. So White, while he was there, had, remember we said he was a great artist and a good map maker, he had made maps of those. So yes. it was not unfamiliar to them. Exactly. So he had written that same year about not finding a cross, quote, I greatly joyed that I had safely found a certain token of their safe being at Croatone, which is the place where Manteo was born and the savages of the island are friends, end quote. White also wrote, quote, the next morning, it was agreed by the captain and myself, with the master and others, to weigh anchor and go for the place at Croaton, where our planters were, for that then the wind was good for that place, end quote. So when White and the landing party entered the Fort Palisade, they found the housing had been taken apart and looted, and any items that could have been carried out were gone, and five large trunks that had been buried had been dug up and cleaned out, including three that White had left his possessions in, back in 1587, and also missing were all of the colony's boats at the shore. And this is the thing. He had uh, several books and things that he had put in those other trunks. The covers were torn from them. They had been rained on. There was also a piece of armor that had rusted through, which indicated to him that the trunks had probably been looted pretty much right after they left. Mm -hmm. So he felt like from the rust on the armor that it had been sitting out for quite some time. So a bit of detective work going on here because they're not finding much of anything. Right. Just the more I hear about this story, and especially with the way that Lawler writes, you you feel like you're there with them. Mm -hmm. And this is something that he talks about in, in his book as you get through it too. There's a lot of holes in the information as well. And it's hard to say why those holes are there. For instance, yeah. White never specifically says with regard to those fires and the smoke whether or not they were man-made or not. Like when he uh, happened yeah. upon them, he didn't indicate whether it was a lightning strike or, you know, he did say, okay, there was no sign of men, but then, okay, what started the fire? What, how did that happen? There's a lot of points where those details seem to be left out. And there's no question that a lot of his documentation was lost in right. various attempts to get to and from this place. I mean, every time they wanted to get in and out, there's a reason they call it the graveyard of the Atlantic. I mean, they didn't back then, but they certainly do now. It's dangerous. I mean, even just going ashore, those guys died that day. So there's a lot of points at which his work was discarded into the sea, including his dictionary that he had developed for the Algonquin language. And that may be why there's not as much information as we'd like to have. You know, I guess it contributes to this idea, whether you're reading Lawler's book or other accounts of what happened, you're really almost looking through the fog at this story. And it, normally what happens, I feel like, with the legends that we cover, and especially ones that took place several hundred years ago, like this one did, you expect a little bit of obfuscation to uh, have crept into it just because it's an old story or it predates uh, good record keeping or whatever. But there's something different about this one. There's almost a spooky quality to the story itself. Yeah. And yeah. I want to be clear. I'm not saying that, oh, just because it involves indigenous peoples or whatever. The story itself has a vibe that... Is, I, I don't know. I, I can't put my finger on it. But when you read about it, it takes you to a certain mindset, I guess. Oh, I absolutely agree. And, and this is a great example of what you're talking about here. You don't even have to know the details of who exactly found what, when, or what they exactly saw. But again, just put yourself in the mindset of what has been described here in that they get to this place. John White hasn't seen his family for three years. And it's a, it's a major venture. And you get there and people die just, as you said, getting to the shore that you saw that day. And every time they see an instance of hope, a plume of smoke, they get there and it's a dead end. Yeah. The rug's been pulled out from under them. They see footprints in the sand, but they're native footprints. 
there's no one to talk to. There's not even any natives that might be friendly that they can get information from. Well, and that's the other thing that that Lawler said was that it, it became pretty clear to them that on top of everything else and them not being able to find anybody, they felt that they were being watched. And so wow. that's yeah. one of those situations where, you know, yeah, that's a little spooky, but it is and it isn't. They have no idea who's watching them, but now there's several years of history and some bad blood. So you yeah. can't really be sure whether, it, you know, they have friends there, but they also have indigenous people there who are not interested in hanging out with them and probably no. would just as soon kill them. Yeah, absolutely. As you could see how they treated George Howe, who wasn't doing anything but spearing crabs, they were more interested in seeing them all go, finally, get out of here. And just thinking about a few things that were described, as we just mentioned, these guys were exhausted. On top of everything going wrong, seven crew members being killed, they were out of water, food, supplies. They had marched in, which they thought the source of the smoke was a lot closer than it was in the woods. They get there. It's a lot further than they thought. Now they're exhausted, empty-handed. They have more questions than answers. And just physically, they must have felt terrible as well as emotionally. Well, we're about to wrap up tonight's show, part one of our series here on The Lost Colony. And I'm going to go out with a little segment here from the prelude to Lawler's book that describes what happened when White decided that they wanted to go down to the island of Croatone, I think 50 or 60 miles to the south, where they could hopefully find the colonists that had disappeared. And this is another thing about this forest, and this will come up again when we talk in part two, but can you imagine how long it takes to carve a word into a tree? I mean, it's not a super long time. And on top of that, <laughs> if I guess if you're under duress, you're supposed to carve one of these crosses, right? So well, that's just like, to... hang on, just a minute. We got to get out of here. No, wait, I have to finish this. You know, <laughs> they could have just... well, I suppose they, they could have just stuck up a sticker for the skateboarding truck company independent. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a, what you need. The, uh, yeah, that's the French <laughs> variation of the cross pate. Yes. But at least there was some signal for a rescue mission or a relief mission of boats to find out at least what happened to them. So it was at least a little bit of foresight by John White to arrange this signal, this secret token, for the rescuers or any relief mission that would show up later because if they were in danger, that would give warning to the relief mission, like, hey, watch out, we had to get out of here, skedaddle, because we were about to be killed, or some clue as to where they went. And also for this story, it's one of the few remaining clues that we have about them and the one that remains and that is lasting. And I want to talk a lot more about the carving and we'll do that in part two because that's more of a theory sort of thing. And there's a lot connected with that word too. It actually has come up in pop culture, which I'm sure some of you will know, people that watch American Horror Story that have been watching that over the years. So, well, we're going to wrap up tonight's show with a final little excerpt here from the prelude to Lawler's book, The Secret Token. And uh, this gives you a a chance to see how, how well written it is and how interesting it is and compelling. And it also sets the stage for where we're going next in this story. So this particular section is on page 19 of the prelude in Lawler's book, and it details their attempts to go further south to the island of Croton to try to find the, as they called the planters. The next morning, the sea was still rough as the ships prepared to sail the short 50 miles south to Croton, where our planters are. Suddenly, the anchor cables snapped in the surging seas, and the ship nearly wrecked on a sandbar before the captain managed to steer into a deeper channel. Only one anchor cable remained. Supplies were low, and the weather grew worse. White reluctantly agreed to a new plan. The moonlight would return to England, while the Hopewell would spend the winter in the Caribbean and return in the spring to, quote, visit our countrymen in Virginia, end quote. But as they sailed south, a powerful wind from the west pushed the ship deeper into the Atlantic. The ship arrived off the Azores, an island chain 3,000 miles to the east, but ill winds prevented a landing to restock the dwindling stocks of food and water. The captain had no choice but to make for England. White landed in Plymouth on October 24, 1590, ending a voyage he called, quote, as luckless to many as sinister to myself, end quote. There would be no more search and rescue efforts by the governor. Would to God my wealth were answerable to my will, he wrote, keenly aware that he lacked the deep pockets necessary to finance a new transatlantic expedition. The father never found his daughter or laid eyes on his granddaughter again. They, and the entire colony for which he was responsible, vanished from history. 
That's going to wrap up part one of our two-part series on the lost colony of Roanoke. We'll be back next week with part two. A reminder, we'll be dark for two weeks after that, but following that, we'll be back with three new shows. Please remember to support our sponsors. They help keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi, Scott and Forrest. Hi, I'm Lacey. When I'm not putting too much garlic in my recipes. Galaxy-wide in perpetuity. And I give permission to Astonishing Legends. M-O-R-O-C-K. Our show is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell and co-produced by Tess Feifel, who is also our head of research. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane, and our sound design and additional composing is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to the Astonishing Research Corps. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also support the show at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content. No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night. <laughs>